Okay. Now that we've confirmed the virtual presence of MTIC and D President Jamie Torres Springer, we will begin. I, I, uh, I'm Jano Lieber, Chair and CEO of the MTA. I'd, I'd like to call the March Capital Program Committee meeting to order. Do we have members of the public uh, who would like to provide comments? Yes, we have two. We have four members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you when you have 30 seconds left to conclude your remarks. Our first speaker will be Bradley Shears, followed by Christopher Grief. Grief. Good afternoon. I'm Bradley Brashears, Planning Manager at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. From the Inner Borough Express to Penn Access, riders have many reasons to be excited about the future of our transit system. These major projects have the potential to transform mobility and connectivity around the region, especially for outer borough riders who need better access to transit. And we're excited to hear more details and progress updates in the coming months and years and funding through the next capital program. While these mega projects are exciting, it's also important to make the improvements that may not be as flashy, but it'll make a difference in the lives of everyday riders. It was great to hear about the next 20 year needs assessment at last month's board meeting. We can't stress enough the importance of this comprehensive analysis of the current and future needs of our transit system. The upcoming assessment and capital program could come at a crossroads when the MTA truly has no choice but to invest in projects that will help mitigate climate change and its impacts. We agree with many of the priorities described last month, including resiliency and accessibility, that must see major investment in the next capital program. It's encouraging to see that you're taking into account regional changes and trends in population, transit usage, land use, and the need for sustainability when developing the next 20-year needs assessment. We encourage you to continue to, to listen to the needs and concerns of riders when developing these important documents. We're also looking forward to seeing the results and work of the Track Intrusion tra Task Force, an issue that has continued to worry riders after another month of deadly track intrusions. Front-facing cameras on every train are a great addition, and the MTA should continue to use every tool available to minimize these tragedies. We continue to applaud and thank you for the many important projects that are being completed both on time and on budget. We're confident that with the right investments and prioritization, a more accessible, resilient, and reliable transit system is within reach. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Christopher D. Greif, not grief. As Andrew says, he will cause grief, but I'm going to cause grief. But anyway, I'm here to discuss not just that, but I'm also here to discuss accessibility, which is important that as we're doing capital, I know we're working on a lot of stations that are going to be accessible, but we need to remind the stations. Some stations' humps are small, some are nice and big, or even the whole platform. As we're going to be building the new future stations, updating them up and getting them built, we need to remind that wheelchairs, walkers, yes, and baby strollers, because baby strollers are also early intervention children who are small, but not just small, but have called a wheelchair stroller, need to have plenty of access to the train and not feeling the, the hump or the jumping of the train. Yes, we know we have old equipment. Yes, we have new equipment. But at the same time, it's also the platform that needs to be even and safer for the customers to get on and off. Because remember, not all disabilities are shown or it could be hidden. I remind that not just on the, but on the subways, but Long Island Railroad and Metro North. We need to update every station, every line that needs to be even, safer, and even on the train and a station platform. As we're getting to in the 21st century, we need to remind that we need to keep working on that. As we see new stations like Hicksville and Long Island that's been updated, that is even, 
even because Q and I were there and he can just jump, can just, that doesn't have to jump but slide right in and get on and off safely. It will be easier if we can do that to all the stations and all MTA stations. Thank you, everyone. And just for the record, it's G R E I F. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlton D'Souza. He is virtual and he will be followed by Jason Anthony, our last speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlton D'Souza. I'm the president of Passengers United. And I want to talk about the Mineola Long Island Railroad Station because the elevators uh, are on the new overpass, on the brand new overpass, have not even been installed or put in yet. And John Michno uh, from Mineola wants to know when are the elevators going to be installed at Mineola? And right now, the old elevators are constantly out of order. They're breaking down. So is there a way that the LIRR can arrange a van shuttle for those who have to cross over to the other side, because it's a very big inconvenience. And I also want to talk about the Hollis Long Island Railroad Station, which, you know, we, we got to get the funding to get it done now. You know, I know you guys have gotten back to me at Capital Construction, and you've told me proposals, but I want to know, you know, are the elected officials behind this? Is it going to get done? Uh, because the station is falling apart. Same thing with Huntress Point Avenue and East New York. Those stations are in horrible conditions. And, you know, we're encouraging people to come back to use the MTA, but we have to make these stations safe, shiny, bright, clean, and accessible. And also for wheelchair accessibility as well. You need elevators, especially for our elderly. So we have to welcome people back to the railroad, and that's very important. And then also the integration with, uh, you know, Long Island's bus system. So, you know, the MTA's Capital Construction Committee, you guys need to think about bringing back Long Island bus because Nassau and County Express is not working for us. And in terms of the overnight shutdowns, the N24 and the N22 nice bus is not working out for us. The buses are missing. They're not showing up. So we need the MTA to run the shuttle buses in Long Island. Not nice. Thank you. Good afternoon, Jano. Jason Anthony from AOU. If the previous speaker is talking about LIRR privilege, let's talk about the subway system. What about 6th Avenue on the Canarsie Line? And what about Chambers Street on the Nassau Street Line? Those stations or in a horrendous condition. Sixth Avenue was closed during the Canarsie sh shutdown. It wasn't fixed. Chambers Street on the, on the Nassau Street line, when Mayor Adams went to that station, it was, it felt like a, a tremendous embarrassment. Although that Chamber Street on the Nassau Street line is accessible, but it needs attention. It needs repairs. Let's see if we get investment to fix those stations. Because every time that I go to those stations, it, I need to run away from them ASAP. Because it, it looks horrible channel to be honest because we need to fix them and it needs to be fixed ASAP. I'll see you guys in the next meeting. Our last speaker is uh, virtual Charlton D'Souza. I'm just reading what I have. This is what I I'm pretty have. sure you've completed the list of four speakers that you announced at the outset. You want to check?
I have showing one virtual speaker. And, and I think you heard from him. Okay. He's not virtual. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the comments for thank, the public Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our, our speakers, um, always interesting and always informed um, folks who, who come to, uh, to give us, share their views at, at MTA committee meetings. Um, uh, copies of the January 2022 and February Capital Program Committee minutes have been distributed and are available on the website. Are there any changes? Yes. Uh, on page five, uh, Bowden is misspelled. It should be B O D I N, not B O D E N. It's not Carlton D'Souza, it's Charlton D'Souza. Mm. But much more importantly, on page 23, when discussing the Coney Island Yard, it says West End B and Brighton D. It's reversed. Oh, okay. All right. 30 lashes with a wet noodle. 30 lashes with a wet noodle to everyone who, who was involved with that one. Thank you for the corrections. We will, with those corrections, may I have a motion? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? The minutes are approved. Uh, before we get started, I just want to note something that happened yesterday on the capital program, which is that I was, uh, I was uh, invited to and attended a meeting of a, a new uh, and very significant uh, community group called Queen's Power uh, at Rufus King Park in Jamaica. Uh, it, the, the group is comprised of mostly faith-based organizations and some community organizations. And I was, I was asked uh, to, to come and answer a series of questions, very direct questions, about would I make certain commitments, mostly about, par uh, about dialogue and participation. But one question that I was asked directly was, um, is there going to be, uh, are there going to be ADA elevators um, installed at Locust Manor and Laurelton stations uh, on the LIRR? And although I don't think we've become absolutely formal for public for both of those, they have been in design and the selection has been made final in the interim um, that those two stations are going to receive uh, ADA elevators and other ADA upgrades. So I just wanted to share that with the, with with the board. It was it was a big it was big news for that community, which uh, includes a lot of senior citizens and folks who have been uh, asking for ADA elevators. The good news is not only is ADA uh, uh, improvements, or not only are ADA improvements coming to that those stations, but the entire Southeast Queens neighborhood is going to get about a 30 percent increase in service when east side access and third track are done and i think that in tandem with more access and all the things that we're doing to make it more affordable to use the commuter railroads inside new york city especially as well as the commuter railroads in general um, huge step forward uh, for the southeast queens community so i thought i would share that back to more pedestrian matters mr savio are there any changes to the with the committee work plan uh, Mr. Chairman, there are no changes to the work plan. That being said, uh, President Torres Springer is now visible, and I'll turn it over to him for his update. Thank you very much, Chair, and I want to apologize to the committee and the board that I'm not there in person today. I'm uh, uh, COVID has finally caught up to uh, to me and my family, so uh, I'm I'm following the protocols and and isolating uh, for a few days. Um, having said that, I, I'm uh, I'm pleased to be able to give the board. Uh, uh, somewhat of an update on uh, our progress at construction and development over the last month. Um, the first bit of news uh, is that our uh, uh, advertisement list for 2022 procurements for contracts uh, is now live on the MTA website. Uh, this shows the public in more detail how we plan to meet the ambitious commitment target of $8.1 billion uh, for this year that I laid out last month. Uh, it also is a big help to our contracting community so they can plan ahead to help them work with us. So this is one of the things that we've been working on is to give a forward schedule um, with a clear list of what we intend to advertise uh, over the next few quarters. Uh, in addition to that, there's a few notable updates on work in progress across the system. 
Uh, for New York City Transit, we recently achieved substantial completion on the Grand Central uh, Times Square shuttle project, which means that the shuttle is now fully ADA accessible. It's easier to navigate and faster to board. Uh, we also opened a brand new staircase entrance into the heart of Times Square at 42nd and Broadway. Uh, we also will have a new street to concourse elevator that will open to the public this May through a separate ADA project that's being jointly delivered with a private developer at the one Times Square building. Uh, on the railroads for Metro North, um, we, uh, we mentioned in the uh, press release yesterday that the Dobbs Ferry culvert repair was completed. This was a remarkable project that responded to an emergency situation caused by Hurricane Ida last summer. Uh, we were able to mobilize a design builder to complete that project and uh, repair the culvert in less than six months. What this means is that Metro North can cut travel times through the area by up to five minutes in conjunction with the new timetables that went into effect yesterday that restore uh, service uh, across the system to 89% of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, also for Metro North, we announced the beginning of construction on three ADA projects on the Harlem line at Hartsdale, Scarsdale, and Purdy's. Um, for the Long Island Railroad, we hit another milestone at the Elmont UBS station as part of third track uh, when we installed a pedestrian overpass bridge over the course of a single night this month. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Chair, we are also proceeding with accessibility improvements at multiple stations. Uh, and I did note the public speaker's uh, uh, comments about some of the stations. Uh, we are close to uh, finishing the improvements at Mineola. Um, and we'll get back to them. Uh, as for some of the stations that were mentioned, we do have work uh, planned within the capital plan uh, going forward. Um, uh, in a moment, we'll turn it over to our two business unit leaders uh, for this month's business unit updates. I just wanted to give a, a very quick overview. Uh, we'll be talking first about bridges and tunnels. And I uh, wanted to note that, <coughs> excuse me, our success in keeping our bridges in good condition is remarkable. Um, we always note in the national news uh, and from reports that all across the state and country, there are bridges that are in poor condition, which was an animating part of the conversation around the infrastructure bill federally. That simply is not the case for MTA bridges and tunnels. Our staff ensure that this critical infrastructure is maintained in a state of good repair uh, and maintaining these bridges and the toll revenue that they bring in is critical for our overall financial picture. In short, it means that we can focus, uh, as we'll hear about at the full board meeting on Wednesday, our efforts to obtain federal funding on projects other than state of good repair for bridges and tunnels. Um, so that's, that's a significant a feature of all the work that's done in our bridges and tunnels group. We'll also hear from our infrastructure group, which is doing a great job delivering the projects that will never make the headlines, but that keep the system running smoothly. Uh, one example you'll hear about this month uh, is the Coney Island Yard project, which is a, a critical example of the type of resiliency work that's so important to the long-term future of the system. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Chair Lieber. Thanks. All right, I, I'm told we're not going to have the capital program update focusing on C and D bridges and tunnels. Uh, let's hear first from Joe Keen of B and T. Okay. Uh, morning. Uh, B and T's bridge and tunnels range in age from 50 to almost 90 years old. Over the past decades, we have proactively invested in a state of good repair of our bridge and tunnel facilities while continuously improving them to meet modern standards and to improve resiliency and accessibility. As a result, in accordance with the FHWA ratings, our critical revenue producing assets are in sound condition. This directly benefits our bond rating, lowering debt service costs and helping the MTA's overall financial position. In addition to maintaining state of good repair, these facilities are an integral part of the New York City Regional Transportation Network. And as such, we partner with regional transportation agencies to improve traffic flow accessibility and safety in the region whenever possible. Our 20 to 24 capital program continues these necessary programmatic investments to ensure a continued state of good repair of these facilities. 
Over the next several slides and the upcoming video, we will be discussing several of our recently completed and ongoing initiatives that illustrate these investment team themes. In 2021, we were able to exceed our commitment plan by 50% while also meeting planned completion goals. The most significant commitments and completions are listed on the slide. In 2022, we're planning to commit 513 million and complete 560 million in projects. Overall, we have committed 99% of the planned projects in the 15 to 19 capital program, excluding program reserves. This upcoming video highlights four of BNT's recent project completions. Project CB18 installed new fender systems at the Marine Parkway and Cross Bay bridges and installed scar protection at the Cross Bay Bridge. This project replaced existing substandard deteriorated fender systems with new fender systems, which are designed to federal guidelines for ship collision protection using fiber reinforced plastic piles and rubber defender facing elements. New access walkways, new safety railings, and new navigational lighting were also installed. At the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, Project VN10 implemented a series of improvements and repairs to Staten Island and Brooklyn anchorages to return these structures to a state of good repair and to improve their long-term performance and resiliency. This project sealed the anchorage exteriors from water intrusion, upgraded anchorage dehumidification systems, installed fire alarm systems in the I-bar chambers, and implemented civil and drainage improvements to the anchorage exteriors. At the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge, Project RK66 enhanced the electric power resiliency of the open road tolling infrastructure at the bridge and improved the flood protection of the Robert Moses Building electrical and mechanical systems. The work of the project involved installation of two new emergency generators, construction of six new redundant power substations with automatic transfer switches, installation of three miles of new five kilovolt feeders from three separate Conet power grids, and installation of new standalone prefabricated electrical substations and boiler room buildings situated above the 500-year floodplain adjacent to the Robert Moses building. At the Hugh L. Carey Tunnel, Project HC07 performed rehabilitation of key mechanical components of the tunnel ventilation system and installed a tunnel fire suppression system prototype. Testing of the water mist fire suppression system successfully demonstrated its ability to control a tunnel fire by reducing the temperature of hot gases, thereby protecting tunnel infrastructure and allowing ease of access by first responders. In the next several slides, uh, we will discuss some of our ongoing projects. At the RFK, we're in the process of improving pedestrian and bike accessibility between East Harlem and Randalls Island Park. We recently awarded the construction of a new pedestrian bike access ramp, which will connect the RFK Manhattan span to the future seven acre waterfront park that will be constructed by New York City EDC in East Harlem. The new park will complete a missing link in the existing Manhattan Greenway. Ramp construction has been coordinated with New York City EDC and will be completed before the waterfront park begins construction in 2023. A rendering of the new ramp is shown in the lower left-hand corner of the slide. Uh, to complete Randall's Island accessibility improvements, we'll be awarding the construction of new pedestrian bike access ramps and new vehicular ramps at the end of this year. 
This project will enable future reconstruction of the Manhattan Plaza structure, enhance traffic safety on both RFK Bridge and on Randall's Island. Once completed in 2025, the new pedestrian bike ramps will transform access to Randall's Island Park, benefiting thousands of people during special events on Randall's Island, as well as hundreds of everyday park users. At the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, this $222 million project to replace a portion of the upper level approaches is currently 75% complete. This project included 10 main stages of roadway deck reconstruction. Construction of the last stage is now complete and the upper level will be restored to its full seven lane capacity in early April, four months ahead of the original schedule. The project remains within budget with completion in August anticipated nine months earlier than originally contracted. The construction team's success in reducing duration of customer impacts while maintaining the critical bus HOV contraflow lane operation throughout a very challenging construction period has been noteworthy. At the Throgs Neck Bridge, this $336 million project includes replacing the suspended span deck with a lighter steel deck, as well as significant steel strengthening, painting, and utility work. Deck work has been performed in six major stages with a movable barrier and a reversible lane used to maintain three travel lanes in the peak direction, mitigating traffic impacts. The contractor had a significant learning curve and was impacted by adverse weather during the first stage of deck replacement, but has overcome these issues in subsequent stages and is now on track to complete the project on schedule. The delays in stage one will result in the contractor exceeding the 15 month milestone of allowable lane closures. We are currently evaluating the contractor's requested adjustments to this 15 month milestone in light of weather and COVID delays. Four of the six stages are now complete and stage five is progressing ahead of schedule. The project is currently 70% complete and is on track for completion in November. That concludes my report. Thank you, Joe. I, I think we're always all, all always impressed by the, the caliber of your projects and the way they get executed. So speaking for myself as a uh, refugee from CND. Um, um, would any, any members of the board like to pose a question or comment? Cries of joy. Victor. Thank you. Um, I was just at, um, in regards to the pedestrian paths, uh, new bridges that you're building, uh, they are going to be accessible. They look like it, um, but they are up to ADA code, right? Yeah, that's correct. They, Great. they meet ADA codes. Yep. Great. Thank you. Okay. No other questions being... Oh, Hayden? No, I thought um, Throgs Neck Bridge was going to be done by September. It got pushed, or was it always November? It was always November. It was always November. Okay. My bad. Sorry. Okay. Um, let's hear from Bob Laga and Dana of the uh, C&D Infrastructure Business Unit. You'll be hearing from Bob. And his voice has made that decision for us. Yes. Okay. Bob, go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Lager, Vice President of Infrastructure, filling okay, in. Okay, I, I, I do this sometimes. I blew it on the sequence. We're supposed to hear from the IEC Not on a problem. bridges and tunnels first. Joe, sorry about that. <coughs> no problem, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. The IEC is reporting on the Throgs Neck Bridge orthotropic deck replacement. It begins on page 17 of your committee book. Overall, the project is 70% 70, 70 complete and well within budget of $336 million. And with the November 22 substantial completion remains on schedule as well. The early construction issues Mr. King just mentioned and the weather problems uh, which had the potential to delay the project are being mitigated through the resequencing of remaining activities uh, tr of transferring suspender rope and main cable work to a future project with similar activities. The IAC is supportive of this minor scope transfer, which mitigates the delay to the project as well as minimizing impact to the public of the continued lane closures. The IAC is confident in CND completing this project on time with continued close management of the contractor. Regarding budget, the project is forecasting an estimate at completion of $310 million. 
the IEC's cost review finds that the project can be completed within this time, within this amount. Apologies. Regarding risks, many risks have been closed, and the remaining risk, which could extend substantial completion, are minimal. And that concludes my report on the Thrugs Neck Bridge deck replacement. Thank you, Jim. Any questions for the IEC? Okay. Coming back to uh, C and D's infrastructure unit, Bob Laga. Good afternoon. I am Bob Laga, Vice President of Infrastructure, filling in for Dana Heck, the Senior Vice President of Infrastructure. I am going to provide an overview of the portfolio of critical projects within the infrastructure business unit, along with updates on four major projects currently under construction. Try the other button. Yeah. No. There we go. As you can see, we are very busy working to keep the subway and bus systems operating safely and effectively. The projects and infrastructure may not be the ones you hear about every day, but these projects upgrade power to our subways, implement safety, security, and upgraded communication systems in our stations and depots, rehabilitate and rebuild sandy damaged facilities, and ensure structural integrity of the bridges that our customers and employees traverse while on our subways. This slide illustrates the diversity of improvements and accounts for one-third of the New York City Transit Capital Program. In 2021, we successfully delivered 58 commitments despite staffing resource constraints and COVID-related budget constraints. Through the efficiency of bundling, the value of work put out on the street is almost $1 billion. As you will see on the next slide, infrastructure is strategically prepared to improve on last year's delivery with an even more robust program. There we go, awards. Okay. <clears throat> with a continued focus on state of good repair and continuous improvements to the delivery process, our commitments for 2022 is more than double the value of projects we delivered in 2021. To ready ourselves for these lofty goals, we are looking to address personal concern, personnel concerns, maximize project team structures, share best practices and lessons learned within our own business units, as well as from other business units and supplement with consultant support. Again, these projects provide for the necessary state of good repair improvements to ensure a reliable and safe New York City transit operating system through the addition of new substations, upgraded maintenance shops, upgrade of power equipment, and the very important continued focus on resiliency and flood mitigation. For long-term preservation, this year's program will also have a focus on painting our rail structures along with steel repairs on four different lines through three contracts valued at over half a billion dollars. Coney Island Yard. <clears throat> Coney Island Yard in Brooklyn it, the Coney Island Yard in Brooklyn is the largest yard in New York City transit system. It serves seven lines, and when Superstorm Sandy flooded this yard with millions of gallons of water, the criticality of this yard became quite apparent due to the detriment of the subway operations. A major component of this project is a 12,000 linear foot perimeter wall uh, as seen on the slide. No, it's not. It's not. It's this equates to 2.2 miles or a subway ride from Penn Station to the Museum of Natural History. Over 8,000 feet or one and a half miles has been constructed thus far. The wall is 12 to 15 feet high and is driven 30 feet deep. Why am I mentioning this? To illustrate the magnitude of the structure and come this fall, we will have our largest yard fortified so we never experience the damage we did after Superstorm Sandy. Along with the walls, two pump stations are under construction with continued progress of drainage piping and power and communication cables. Some cutting over from the existing communications to newly constructed cables have begun. A team approach to problem resolution on this very complicated project is evidence as this project is proceeding on schedule and within budget. 
and this project, along with many others, have experienced supply chain challenges, again demonstrating the tremendous work of the entire team keeping this on schedule. The cost increase you see is due to the addition and reconstruction of four circuit breaker houses discussed in the October presentation. Adding this to the contract saved time and money by eliminating procurement and mobilization costs. Building the CBH concurrently with the yard projects allows for proper sequencing of workflow and protection of the newly constructed power feeds described above. 207 Street Yard. In Upper Manhattan, the 207 Street Yard serves many lines and many functions as seen on the slide. The, hard, the yard hardening contract was bundled to include perimeter walls, pumps, two signal relay buildings, the largest in the MTA system and shown on the slide. Signal, tracks, and power was awarded in late 2018. At the direction of the Department of Environmental Protection, a follow-up sewer relocation contract to direct flow away from the yard and prevent backflow from the Harlem River was awarded in late 2019. Both projects are experienced delays in which the team is working on mitigation for. The first contract is behind schedule due to Siemens fabrication issues. The sewer relocation has experienced third-party delays along with Department of Sanitation's moratorium street restrictions. Workshops are being conducted with C&D team along with the utility companies to expedite solutions. Clifton Shop. <clears throat> Staten Island Railroad operates from the St. George Terminal to Tottenville comprising of 21 stations and 14 miles of track. This new state-of-the-art facility will replace the existing sandy damaged and functionally obsolete shop. It will serve the maintenance inspection and repair needs of the current fleet of 61 cars and the future fleet of 75 cars. Since the last presentation in October, the Staten Island Rapid Transit Operating Authority team and the CND team worked very closely to address the outstanding issues that prevented move-in. On March 2nd, a temporary CO was granted and supply room personnel have begun the move-in. Beginning this spring, we will be demolishing, beginning this spring will be the demolishing of the existing building, integration of systems with the RCC, shop punch list work, along with regrading the yard, paving, and landscaping. Substantial completion is currently projected for this fall. However, there is potential for a few months delay and budget increases that the team is currently working with the contractor to mitigate, to mitigate and finalize. Finally, the bus radio. There are still quality and excuse me. There are still quality and schedule concerns on this project. To refresh memories, this project has experienced extensive delays due to contractor quality issues, real estate issues, and the delay of the build out of the bus radio sites. And although they have not been totally resolved, progress is being made and milestones have been achieved. As of March 4th, the first 200 buses within the Staten Island bus service area have been retrofitted. There is another 30-day pilot period that will identify glitches prior to the beginning of retrofitting of the remaining of the 6,000 vehicles. If a glitch is encountered, it may be necessary to pause the pilot and restart the 30-day clock. Staten Island dispatchers began moving into the new bus command center on February 5th. Those buses outlined with the new radio system are being monitored and dispatched from there. There is still work to do and we are currently in mediation to resolve schedule issues, but the trajectory is heading in the right direction. This concludes my report. Thank you. Board Member Albert. Uh, Bob, could you go back to the Coney Island Yard slide, please? Sure. Okay, so you're going to switch the B and the D. Um, okay. The, plus, the R is not the C Beach line. So you, if it, if the R line is served by Coney Island Yard, you have to make it the Fourth Avenue line. But it's not C Beach. Not a problem. I apologize. Thank you. Do you have any alphabetical comments, Mr. Khaleesi? I do not. Please go ahead. Um, 
And all the resiliency stuff going on here, is that paid for? Uh, that's not MTA budget, is that? Um, Sandy, it's federal Sandy funding, budget. FTA funding. And the same thing with Staten Island, was that? Yes. So all that's all Sandy, so it didn't cost us anything. Right. Perfect. Thank you. I just have to say, I, I before we turn it over to Mr. Studio, I've been to all those projects. The, the Coney Island Yard project is extraordinary in scope and complexity, operational challenges. It's being brilliantly managed by a member of Bob and Dana's team, and I, you know, off the cuff, I think that's it's one of those one of those projects that's worth dragging the board out to visit uh, at some time. It really is an amazing project, um, just in scale and complexity. So. We'll, 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 we'll arrange for that. A little, it'll, um, a little improvisation as I go. Uh, Mr. DeVito, the IEC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today the IEC is reporting on four infrastructure projects. The, our report on the Coney Island Yard long-term flood mitigation is on page 26 of your book. Overall, the project is 80% complete and within the budget of $521 million and maintains the revised substantial completion date of December 22. With respect to the budget, the IEC has reviewed the project expenditures, remaining work, potential and executed change orders, and other cost categories, and has confidence in the project finishing on budget. Regarding the schedule, since the last report in October, field conditions have warranted a new installation approach for traction power cables, which will be monitored closely for any schedule impacts. Most of the other work, the flood mitigation, drainage, as Bob had referred to, and then signal work, Breaker, circuit breaker houses are all progressing very well. Top schedule cost, top schedule risk, contract that may account their underground utilities or obstructions where the traction power cables are now planned or track outages may not occur according to plan. The mitigation measures being take, undertaken is that the contractor has performed underground utility surveys, increased the number of test pits. Also, the project is working along with operations and has developed a workable out outage schedule. Our observation is along the same lines that they're working hard to maintain the schedule and budget while coordinating the work in MTA's largest operating yard. The report on 207th Street Yard and Shop project begins on page 34. The 62 month project was awarded in September of 2018 to Walsh Construction and at 72% complete, the CND's estimate of completion remains at $633 million. As previously reported, the project's substantial completion date of November is now forecast to be May of 24, a six-month delay due to the late procurement of del and delivery of the signal equipment. The IEC conducted a, a budget review and, and, sc and schedule and agrees that the project's EAC is substantial completion on this project. However, with the project contingency mostly consumed, the IEC finds the signal contract that performance must improve so as not to further impact the completion of this project. The top risk of further solid state interlocking equipment delays for which it has been decided to perform a factory acceptance test in the field as a mitigation measure. And the IEC has made a recommendation with regard to this risk, which is contained in our report. Apart from the signal system delivery and installation, good progress is being made on all project elements, such as the flood wall, track improvements, and facilities. And that concludes 207th Street. Joe, hang on a second. Yes, Mr. Uh, Board Member Zuckerman has a question. So let's just let's just dive into that last one because you uh, generally have uh, you're generally pretty uh, sanguine on things. That didn't sound such a such a ringing endorsement, especially when the contingency's gone and things need to be improved. So management, can you just give us a sense of how confident you are to do the things the IEC just said related to that project? Where. The project team is meeting with Siemens on a weekly basis to go over every aspect of their equipment that they have to supply us. We've worked with them to try and mitigate some of the delay by having some of the factory testing done in the field that would save them some time and, and money. Um, they're a little reluctant at this moment in time to do it. Um, we're working with them to uh, bring them along and uh, get them to do it. Um, we're working with the subcontractors, uh, the electricians, to get them on board. Everybody's on board. Just got to get Siemens on board to keep this going. Well, we, I have a little experience uh, getting Siemens to get on board uh, in other projects, and so um, I, I, I know. Mark, do you want to say something? Sure. Do you mind if I just no? Go just, ahead. Just the larger context, yeah, if yeah, I could, go, for a second. Go. Um, 
it's been two years of COVID, uh, QBL West, CBTC, 8th Avenue CBTC, um, Culver CBTC, all very intensive projects relating with Siemens. Um, I should commend them on their performance in those projects. Um, I'm very conscious that they have had to overlap their delivery on those three projects and with Bob's 207th project. So what's happening with Siemens is they're beginning, they've had to crush to meet the deadlines and they just don't have the capacity to do everything at once. So we, they have come up with a very good idea of testing in the field. I commend them for that. They are working with us night, noon and morning. They are very frank, they're very open, we know where they are. I would actually leave them a little chance just to let them recover from this for a while. And we met with them on Friday and I think they're going to do the right things. But, but overall, on those other three projects, they met the deadlines. So we'll, I'm sure they'll get there on this one as well. So just a little caution with regards to Siemens. So I, I, look, I appreciate that you're trying to play. Uh, well, by the way, this was not staged for the Siemens people listening. There's no good cop, bad cop plan. Um, uh, I think what Mark's saying is since. <laughs> Well, we have our roles to play in life, I guess. Uh, so I appreciate you being supportive of the, them as a partner. Uh, as a consultant, I like to be treated like a par as a partner with my clients, too, so I, I admire that. Um, but I also have to hearken. We, we have an IEC for a reason. Sure. They, they're, not, they're there to give the board as much sober information as possible and, frankly, to motivate the board at times to take action. Sounds like we're not ready to take action. But at some point, and by the way, let's not, let's not humor ourselves, Siemens is being properly compensated for the struggle they're going from. It's not a not-for-profit. They're not doing yeah. this out of the goodness of their hearts. So um, we should just be mindful that at some point, if, if I at least keep hearing what Joe is saying, at some point this board will have to ask Siemens what's going on sure. because those do not sound like positive yeah. indica indicators. If I could... Uh Mr. There's a couple of things that we're doing to help as well because we've recognized that the suppliers that provide uh, equipment to Siemens and the suppliers that supply equipment to them sometimes have difficulty meeting our standards. There's a very small supply base for some of those things so we can see things that we can improve um, from the MTA side to actually help Siemens deliver in the future. So we're having all those types of detailed discussions and it is very transparent. So I, I would be happy to have the question but I, I think they're doing quite well. Make a suggestion that wh why don't we chew on some of the issues that uh, Board Member Zuckerman has raised and come back in writing and, if necessary, at, a, at a, the next month or two uh, to give him and the members of the committee an update. Um, so, is that acceptable? Okay. Um, with that, Mr. DeVito, you continue, please. Thank you. The report on the 207th Street sewer replacement project is on page 40 of your book. Regarding the schedule of this project, the substantial completion date was originally February of 2024. Due to third-party utility company delays, as well as the impact of a conflicting Department of Sanitation moratorium, the substantial completion is now forecast to be January of 2025, a delay of 11 months or three months since our last report. C&D has requested a recovery schedule from the contractor, who is being which is being evaluated, and the IEC will have its opinion once we've reviewed this plan. Regarding the budget, the project is over budget with an EAC of $170 million due to time impact costs associated with third-party utility delays in relocating their lines. A budget modification is being prepared to address the cost difference. The IEC estimate at completion is slightly higher at 173 and includes an additional allocation for risk. The top risks associated with this and their associated mitigations are outlined in our book. And our one recommendation here is that the project further explore the potential to accelerate the concrete jet work, check route work, comp and complete it ahead of the moratorium, which I believe they're working on. And this concludes our report on 207th Street. The Clifton Shop Yard, the Clifton Shop uh, project begins on page 46 of your book, and at 94 percent, the Staten Island Railway Shop is nearing completion. Beneficial use has been achieved, and transfer of equipment and employees has begun. The project's substantial completion date has moved from June to October, a four-month adjustment since the last report. The IEC believes that the substantial completion may have an additional two-month delay based on our assessment of the time needed to complete the finishes, testing and commissioning, and to vacate and demolish the old shop. Project budget is at $212 million, and C&D is evaluating this budget amount as necessary. Top risk on a project, as from our perspective, is that the discovery of unforeseen hazardous materials during the demolition of the old shop 
Uh, in that regard, addition, additional test pits will be drilled once the old shop has been completely vacated as a mitigation. Finally, it was our obs observation that in addition to an improved work environment, Staten Island Railway should realize efficiency gains from the new and updated shop equipment and the new facility layout. On bus radio system, the report is on page 49 of your committee book. The IEC notes that progress has been made in achieving milestones such as the completion of the bus radio installation on the 200 pilot, pilot buses and it is helping to move the project forward. As mentioned by C&D, the completion of the pilot test, which has started, will be a major milestone and will provide confidence in system reliability and performance. Overall, this project is 67% complete. It has exceeded its budget and is significantly delayed due to slow contractor progress on base stations, pilot bus installations, and a reliable BRS network. Regarding the schedule, the project has not accepted the latest contractor schedule update, which shows a May 24 substantial completion. PTG attributes the delay to the Kearney base station. However, C&D believes the, it is the bus installation driving the critical path, and the IEC agrees with that assessment. The project team is continuing to be aggressive and drive the contractor to this December 2023 uh, completion, which would be a three-month delay since our last report. To complete this project on time, an average of 350 buses per month must be completed. The Department of Bus, I understand, has given its assurance that sufficient buses will be provided to preserve this latest completion date of December 2023. IEC recognizes that the contractor has yet to perform installation at this higher rate, which is somewhat offset by the experience he will be gaining during the pilot stage, which could allow for a swift ramp up of the bus radio installation productivity. The project's estimate at completion is at $330 million. It exceeds budget by $36 million. For our part, the IEC's forecast continues to forecast an estimate of completion of $350 million due to the impacts of delays, change orders, and risks. Ultimately, a budget, mod a budget modification will be needed to bring it into alignment with the EAC. Our observations, with 71 months having elapsed since award, significant work still remains. The contractor is responding by augmenting their staff with additional network engineers, system engineers, and bus installation staff. Also, the IEC has observed that technical issues are now being addressed in a more disciplined fashion, and in-service testing of fully equipped buses has proven to be of use in identifying technical and operational issues, reducing the risk of failures during the pilot and the potential delay to the project completion. And this concludes our comments on bus radio. Mr. Chairman. Does anyone want to comment on that further? Questions? This is a, uh, Mr. Roche, any further comments on the bus radio project? I, I went to an event last week and the, uh, the chairman of one of the key subcontractors, an outfit called Clever Devices, was there uh, when I spoke in Long Island. And I did say to him, as, as Mr. DeVito said, we, 350 buses a month have to get uh, these installations in order for the schedule to maintain and I, I, I just took the occasion to push it with him because that's the next the, the, the next question for this project. It's had a lot of problems starting with the real estate and on and on and on. We're in mediation so we're not going to talk about who's responsible for those problems um, but the next phase is making sure that the pace of these installations, fairly complex installations in these buses is upped significantly. That's the next uh, milestone to be achieved. Anything else? Uh, J just when yeah. you, maybe you can give another sentence, if you will, on your tete-a-tete -tete with this gentleman. Um, did 350 seem reasonable to him that he could achieve? Hey, we didn't get into a debate. I just underscored for him that I, you know, I guess my point was he, they are, Clever is the outfit that's performing a lot of these installations and we're counting on them on PTG's behalf on the general contractor team's behalf and we're counting on them to figure out how to accelerate that that was the message that I I, I delivered to that that gentleman uh, I'm not sure he was glad that he had came to have coffee and listen to my speech but but uh, um, there we go um, all right onward um, I hear we're going to have a display of procurement uh, expertise from Mr. Plachaki. Let's have at it. Good afternoon. 
Uh, construction and development has 15 procurement actions being brought to the Capital Program Committee this month. There are no non-competitive items, 14 competitive items totaling $240.3 million, and one ratification totaling $1.6 million. I will highlight two of the items, both of which are competitive procurements. The first item requests approval of the award of a publicly advertised and competitively solicited contract to RailWorks Transit LLC for design-build services for the Babylon Interlocking Signal System Project in the amount of $58,134,000. This contract will upgrade and modernize the Babylon Interlocking Signal Systems and equipment, the majority of which hasn't been upgraded since the 1960s and has exceeded its useful life. A one-step request for proposal method was conducted to solicit this contract, which resulted in RailWorks Transit LLC being unanimously selected for award based on their proposal offering the best overall value, considering the technical strength of the proposal, understanding of the work, and the price being the lowest pro uh, proposed cost. The second item being highlighted requests approval of the award of a publicly advertised and competitively solicited contract to TAP Electrical Contracting Services Incorporated for the design-built services for closed-circuit television cameras at various locations throughout the New York City Transit subway system in the amount of $50,277,000. Under this design-build contract, TAP Electrical will design, furnish, and install security cameras at the entrance and exits, exits uh, to the fare array control areas, 88 stations throughout the subway system. The installation of these new security CCTV cameras represents an integral part of the MTA's ongoing effort to increase security for its customers and employees in subway stations and safeguard critical infrastructure. A two-step request for proposal method was conducted to solicit this contract, which resulted in TAP Electrical being unanimously selected for award. The selection committee's recommendation was based on TAP Electrical's proposal offering the best overall value, which considered their reduction in schedule, strength and qualifications of key personnel, past performance, as well as offering the lowest proposed cost. The remaining items, which include a contract to provide design services to add CBTC to three additional lines, a contract series to provide on-call asbestos and lead management services, authorization to exercise an option for CBTC onboard equipment for an additional 128 R211 operating units, and ratification of a modification to the east side access traction power systems contract are described in detail in the staff summaries contained in your committee books. I submit these 15 procurement actions for your consideration and vote. Thank you. Questions or comments on this, these procurements? Uh, on, the, on the R211 item that you just mentioned, as those cars have yet to enter revenue service, why are we ordering more before we see how they are received and how well they run? Uh, this is not to order additional cars. This is actually just the CBTC equipment for those additional for those cars. cars. Exactly. I got for it. The additional Thank you. cars. Anybody else? Okay. Um, can I have a motion to approve the items? So moved. Uh, second? All right. All, all uh, in favor? Any opposition? The motion carries. Before we break, uh, Tim Mulligan, we, I think the board is aware that we have proposed and the governor has proposed adjustments to the design build thresholds. To give us to give the C and D folks uh, more flexibility about what size of projects are required to go to design build. Tim, would you update on where that stands? Yeah. So there's there's ongoing budget negotiations uh, in Albany uh, with the uh, both houses in the legislature on the language that was included in the governor's budget that raises the threshold for um, projects that are state of good repair, so replacement incline to 400 million. And, uh, you know, the budget negotiations are, are live and ongoing. Um, we remain optimistic that when there's a budget deal achieved that the proposed increase in the threshold will be part of the uh, enacted budget, but we await the outcome of those negotiations. Okay, thank you. I just wanted the board to be aware that that's very much a live, a live issue. Um, is there any other business that anyone wishes to discuss? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Motion, the committee meeting is adjourned.